everyone. Welcome back to the Brand and Joe podcast. Our guest today is Ellie Hochman. She received her master's in IO psychology from Bellevue University and is currently the career coach and founder of Rock and Secure. Welcome, Ellie. Thanks for joining us today. Hi. Hi, Brandon. Hi, Joe. I'm so excited to be here. I think the last time we all got to discuss was probably when you spoke to our class, right? Or maybe yeah. me. I don't, Brandon, I don't know if you guys got to talk, but uh, that was a fun time. That was, I like, I think I found that like a week before and I like saw you on LinkedIn. I was like, oh, you're doing some really cool things. And then our board came up and they're like, oh, she's actually speaking to our class. Have you done that before? Like speak to different programs? Yes. Yeah. Oh, I love it. I do it regularly for my alma mater and then just every once in a while for other schools that I happen to get connected with. And it's so much fun for me. And it's actually like very much tied to my original mission of why I even started doing this. So yeah do it all the time and love it. Yeah, it's a great, great uh, networking tool and just in general communicating with people. It was so funny because one of our board members, Sarah, was like, I want to have Ellie speak to our cohort. And I want to say it might have been like three or four days before that you had just reached out to me on LinkedIn. And I was like, well, I know who Ellie is. So yeah, like, let's do it. I'm, I'm all in. And I feel like it was a super valuable session. I believe it was like finding your IO niche. And I just like the way that you handled it. I thought it was very interactive. And it's good. We Joe and I have been through a couple of sessions, whether it was through our program or just external to our program where you're sitting there and you're just listening. So I feel like you did a really good job engaging with people. It was great. Thank you. Thank you. That's always my goal. Do you before we get into like the actual bulk of the episode, do you have trouble like engaging with um or do students have trouble like participating is that like how do you like kind of cultivate a good environment for them to like bring up because i feel like we've been in a couple and you like everyone's just kind of like sitting there but i feel like you did a great job like getting people involved and like starting oh thank you my strategy there is always just that i think people better grasp a concept when they say it out loud themselves So if I am going to share my expertise with you out loud and you're going to listen to it, you're going to learn it at about, I don't know, like 10, 20 percent. But if you listen to me and then you think about it yourself and you problem solve yourself and then you say your own answer out loud, you will retain that so much more. And so if there's anything I can do to try to get that process happening That's what I'm focusing on. And so discussion questions are a big part of that. I, too, am a professor. I'm an adjunct instructor at Vanguard University. And something that I've been learning as I've been going through from class to class, because I've structured them all a little bit differently, is that the classes where my students got the most value were the ones that were based around discussion questions and kind of problem solving, especially if they can do it in a kind of peer-to-peer environment, like in a breakout room, because... I think that there's a lot of content out there that you could just go and listen to. So why spend time that we have together in a session together just listening when I could just record a podcast and you could just listen to that? And and you could also maybe, you know, draw or color or doodle or like do something with your hands to keep you engaged. But when you're when you're when you've got that time with people, use that time. And I'm always I find myself like shocked and surprised sometimes when I go into these sessions and they are interactive and I hear people talking out loud. I'm shocked and surprised by how truly brilliant people can be and how they can, you know, it really inspire themselves. And that's something I love to see happen. And so I'm always trying to facilitate that. Yeah, from like an L&D lens, I, in my current role, we do a lot of trainings and things of that nature. And it's so interesting to see sometimes you have different cultures that respond differently to interaction. Like we, we work with some international clients and for the international clients, you might see in America more engagement and then in maybe an Asian country, they wait until they're called on or things of that nature. So cultivating that type of environment definitely changes with a different culture, but also from an L&D lens. Like we always notice that like in our feedback surveys, when we analyze those, everybody talks about the learnings they get from other people speaking like peer to peer. Like you said, Ellie, like they are able to learn so much more when they're hearing from other people going through similar situations or circumstances. So whatever you're doing to create that environment and make it happen is definitely uh, something that is helpful. And I can tell you that at my work, we, we see it being beneficial for sure. Yeah. And sometimes when I'm building a program or a, an activity of any sort, or I'm, I'm getting ready for a guest session, 
I'm always thinking like, would I like to be in this session? And if the answer is no, then I need to change it. And I am a person that gets bored very easily. And so often I'm a pretty good litmus test <laughs> for how entertaining this session is going to be. And I never settle for, no, I'm not going to go to this. This would be boring. So that's also part of it too. It's just using myself as the litmus test. I want to get to uh, the bulk of the reason we had you on today, Ali, because you do something really cool and but you started yourself rock and secure. So before we get into actually what you do at Rock and Secure, what led you to start and or found as your your own career coaching company and uh, to kind of like uh, escape the external world, I guess. When I guess you really is external world, but I mean like as your own uh, your own place. I got you. I got you. I think it's helpful to describe where I was before I was a full time career coach because I think that lends itself really well into how I started my own business and why career coaching and why IOs, why specialize in IOs, that is. Um, so before I was a business owner, I was a recruiter and then I was a volunteer career coach and I was a data analyst for a while, a business intelligence analyst, as, as my title was. From my recruiting experience, I remember being happy because I was meeting a lot of people and having a lot of cool conversations, but also really frustrated because I wanted to like jump through the phone and take my candidates by the shoulders and shake them and be like, please stop saying what you're saying. And that became very frustrating for me over time because it was happening like over and over and over again, which lent itself very well to being a volunteer career coach because I could take all the times and all the stories of of these interactions and use them for my career coaching clients. But I had I had much more of a, I, I still have a, a math brain and I wanted to use that math brain to my advantage. And I thought it would be really sexy to be a data analyst. Um, I started kind of browsing online, you know, data analyst programs and certifications. And that was when I came across IO, which felt like a good intersection of what I was doing in HR and what I wanted to be doing, which was that more analytical work. So then I get my master's program right before I graduate. I move into a business intelligence role. I do it for two years. It's a great role on paper. I get paid really well. I have a fantastic team. I work for a very strong, big organization. My boss rocks like Truly, everything about it was so good, except for one small but very important thing, and that is that I had no passion for it. I didn't have any passion for business intelligence. Part of that probably because I wanted a sexy job title. <laughs> so that's kind of on me. And it was one day while I was at work, working my business intelligence analyst job, where I had a, um, a work, my, I call her my work bestie. She had asked me, you know, what would you do with your time if you won the lottery? And I think most people will say things like, I'd go and travel the world or I would never work again. But for me, the answer was crystal clear and came out of me so quickly. And it was just, I would teach high school and college students how to interview. So that kind of goes back to what we were talking about before, how that volunteering and, and having a, a quick session, a guest session at a college being so fulfilling for me because it, it goes back to that first mission. And it was not only that response, but it was the clarity and how quickly that response came to me that really pulled me into kind of just thinking about it over and over again. And then one morning, it was about a month later, I woke up in the middle of the night and it was like somebody was shaking my shoulders the way I wanted to do my candidates and just saying like, Ellie, like you have to follow this idea. Like you got to figure out a way to do this and make money off of it. So I start Googling and I'm like, okay, can I replace my data analyst salary as a career coach? The answer was no, absolutely you can't because, well, that is if you're working for an employer. But if you want a much more challenging approach that's going to be a lot harder and require a lot more skill, you can potentially replace your salary and make more. You just have to start your own business. And while some people would be like, oh, okay, I have to start my business to do this. Never mind, not for me. For me, I was so electrified by that idea of the freedom, the creativity. And I was like, sure, I'll just go on this roller coaster ride. And it has been a ride, but uh, a very exciting and fulfilling ride. And it's really cool that every day I get to just fulfill my dream. But I, I also, I, I can't say I could have done it without all the support that I've gotten from my friends, my family, and particularly my business coaches that I've hired. They have completely changed the game for me and I think saved my business multiple times through the sessions that I've had um, with my, my current business coach, Daniel Botero, just truly saved my business. And so I always like to say, I always like to mention him because he is a really big part of how I got to where I am today. That's, that's an awesome story. I know uh, 
right now specifically, I've been seeing like people going on their own. So I think a lot of people might resonate with that story because sometimes I think specifically right now with the job market, the way it was, some people were just looking at that and be like, okay, might take might take the chance on myself now. But to hear your story, I think is really invigorating for younger IOs because you did build off of experience and you like can have maybe a year or two in one area, a year or two in another and then kind of take that and parlay that into your own niche area, which is for you career coaching. Mm -hmm. And we always talk about the transferable skills and where those can kind of align. And it, and I can tell that those worked for you too, Ellie. One thing that I'm just thinking about when you're talking about that story of like starting up and doing it. Also, just a quick side note, like having a business coach, I think is such a such a strength for you. I, my cousin, not in IO, but he he runs his own website development company and constantly relies on experts outside of his niche. Like he was great at developing websites and great at developing processes, but some of the business stuff he would learn from other people, watch podcasts, like try to grow knowledge. And I think that that as a leader or as somebody who's an owner, that's a huge asset. So props to you and anyone else who wants to go out there and do that. I highly recommend it too. Uh, but anyways. Really quick, uh, Brandon. Yeah. I wanted to maybe just address one of the things that you said in there about seeing the way that the job market looks right now and uh, potentially starting your own business venture. Yeah, I made course. a post about this on LinkedIn actually the other day about how I personally don't think that that's a good idea. If you are starting a business to get out of job searching, you are setting yourself up for failure because having your own business, particularly if you're going to work with external clients, you are job searching 100 times a year. Like, whereas when you're job searching, you need to get one job offer, one really good job offer, or you get like a hundred coaching contracts or a hundred client contracts. And that is job searching over and over and over. That's interviewing over. That's proposals. That's, you know, putting yourself out there for rejection, like truly over and over and over again. So I just want to make that clear that that's my personal opinion that <laughs> If that is your way out of a job search, it's probably not going to set you up for success unless you have a major passion for a problem that needs solving and it's recognized in the market that it needs solving and you know how to solve it and you're very passionate about it, then of course, move forward. But do not just think that starting your own business is a, is a golden ticket out of the job search. It is so much harder than having a job. I can say that with confidence, but... Uh, but if you are truly passionate about it and you've got the right support and financial support and all those systems in place, then yes. And I'm not trying to discourage anyone from starting a business. I just want people to be careful about that decision. It's a big decision. Yeah, it's fair. I'm I'm actually going to follow up on your comment with a question because now I'm just wondering. But so in terms of that, like where you're saying maybe don't, what are some maybe like indicators of someone who is thinking about going on their own and might want to, that might actually be seen as like helpful, for example, like a strong network or like not just a strong network, but like a useful one where like you're engaged in it promptly. Like I know you you have a very engaged network, like you communicate with people very constantly. So like what are some things or indicators you could look for to like kind of go on your own if that's something you'd want to do? Yeah, absolutely. So the advice that I have for people who want to work with external clients and if they want to start their own consulting firm, for example, it's to become an expert and show that expertise with content. So you've hit, bang on, you've hit it. You will build content yourself, yes. But when we talk about networking, I also think of how you can feature other experts in your content, and that pays off big time for networking. I met the author of the book, Content-Based ne Networking, James Carberry, and the idea behind content-based networking is genius. And I'm sure you guys could probably relate to this too because you have this podcast. You can get a conversation with basically anyone you want because you have a platform where you can feature that guest. So it's a ton of value for the person that you're featuring. And so that's what I would recommend to somebody who wanted to start their own business is to start utilizing content-based networking. So definitely read the book but then also put it into practice. And it doesn't have to be a podcast. It can be a blog. It can be a YouTube channel. It could be whatever creative mode of uh, or medium that you want to use. You don't have to do a podcast, but you're much more likely to get people to talk to you when you can give them something in return. And featuring them is a great way to add value to them and get them in, in for a conversation. 
But going back to the main point of creating content, it was only through my content that I have found and gotten the consulting opportunities that I have. I don't publicly sell my consulting services. I only do them for select organizations. But those organizations and the, and the contracts that I've had, they never would have reached out to me if I wasn't already posting that content, except for my parents when they reached out to me for consulting work. They didn't have to look at my content to know I was ready for that. But the other contracts I've gotten, it's through the content that I've posted that they've reached out to me. So um, yeah, creating a content strategy and then also using content-based networking. That's a great way to build your content and network. But also I want to rewind here and maybe double click on what I had said earlier about how you have to be really passionate about a very specific problem that you're solving. I was just having a conversation with another IO as well who was thinking about starting his own business too. And I said that as IOs, we like to we like to solve a lot of different problems and we like to be well versed in problem solving in multiple different areas within like the uh, HR organizational function to convince someone and persuade someone that you are the right professional, you are the right expert for them, they need to feel like you are the best possible option. So something I've even had people say to me before is, I'm working with you, Ellie. I'm hiring you as my career coach because you're the only career coach for IO professionals. And first, firstly, I'm like, thank you. Secondly, I'm like, yeah, that totally makes sense because there's nobody else you could go to who's going to have that same specialization. And so I become a pretty easy pick for you. And I think what people are, a lot of people are worried about is like how they can get like a volume of people um, and how they can get like the right, you know, quantity of people to get interest in their business. But what's actually way more important is quality and how you can make a quality connection with them and show them that you can solve their exact problem. That also requires you to find less clients per year and you can actually charge more because you because you solve such a specific problem. So sorry, I'm, I'm finding myself getting into the weeds here, so I'll stop now, but hopefully that was helpful. No, that, that was amazing. I actually have a couple of thoughts. A, yeah, props to you for starting your own consulting coaching business because you're right. I don't think there is another person in our network, maybe Brandon, correct me if I'm wrong, that has like popularized an IO coaching career like this, especially on LinkedIn that 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 we've seen. Um, because like we knew who you are before I, before you spoke at our, like uh, what we said in the beginning, like our school event thing. Um, so you did a great job like propping yourself That's up. a very technical term, Joe. <laughs> Thank you, Brandon. Thing. I'm not known for my vocabulary, Ellie, but Thanks, <laughs> um, Second, I love what you're saying about the content. I can't even, like, uh, as I said about my content, I, I can't even, like, <laughs> content business network, because I've never heard that before. But it's really interesting to see you, like, attack it from that sort of direction. Because I'm trying to, like, as you were saying, I'm trying to, like, think of, like, what Brandon and I do. And I'm like, oh, nope, we do that. Tried to do that <laughs> before. But it was it was cool hearing you, you, you walk through it like that. When you are, I guess this is more just like a business question for you. When you are putting out content and, and talking with your clients, are you trying to diversify the way that you like send out your content? Like, and I guess the more specific question is when you think when you're putting things on LinkedIn or podcasts on your Spotify or YouTube, wherever wherever you put it, is that to kind of like prop up your coaching service? Is that kind of what I was getting at from what you were talking? That makes sense. So do I post on LinkedIn? Do I create my podcast as a way to generate leads? Kind of, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, yeah. Okay. Totally. I think that, that that's there's... What I was to... <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. I think that there... I like to think of it as both providing value to our community and as a way to get people to know about me, to build awareness of my brand and, and to drive leads. And there's also different types of content too. So sometimes I create content where I think of it more as a deposit of um, this is me depositing to the community, providing a ton of value to the community. And then also sometimes there's posts that are like, I want clients. <laughs> if you're interested in career coaching, here, like, come on over. Let's chat. And what I try to do as much as possible is do like 95% deposits and 5% kind of withdrawals or sales. I often are, what I've found is that it's, um, it's not super successful for me to be selling, um, in like a LinkedIn post or like at the end of my podcast, like things like that. Because it's not personalized. And that's something that I take a lot of pride in is the way that I personalize the prospect experience. When somebody comes into my network and asks for help, I'm not just putting them through 
a system. It is a system, but it's not the same system for everybody. It is personalized to them. And they know that I am actually, I'm actually looking at their LinkedIn profile. I am actually like interested in getting to know them so that they don't feel like a lead. Um, but the content that I've created that has turned into consulting clients has been the content around how I think about recruiting and the recruitment process and the recruitment system that's led to re recruitment consulting contracts. But then also I've been, I've been, I've done some instructional design work just because of the way that my posts are designed. Like my client just really liked how my posts looked. And he was like, I want my course that he was building for his program. I want it to look the same. I want it to look like how you make it look. And I like your knowledge and I like the way that you think. How, do, how would you feel about working together? And that was a really fun, awesome contract. Um, so there's so many benefits to co posting content online. I hope that maybe answered the question. Before I no, to yeah, I'm a, I'm a complete uh, like new when it comes to, I guess, like advertising or like I feel like uh -huh. all, we've, all we've done Brent, is put on LinkedIn. And then hopefully they come, like I said, like when it comes to social media or anything like that, zero clue what's going on. So it, it's really interesting to hear how you do it from your, uh, your content perspective of like all the different avenues and how like you diversify. Very yeah. interesting. And it probably sounds like I just know all this or, but I, I gotta be honest, like so much of it I've learned from my business coaches, both Daniel Botero and the coach I'd had before. And even a sales coach I'd had at one point, like I'm learning these things from others and even from, you know, online content, you know, like I, I didn't just wake up with this knowledge one day. I, I learned it from books. I learned it from people. And then I actually implemented what I was learning. And I think that's, I'll go off on a full tangent about this, but I, I think that there is a lot of knowledge absorption that's happening, but not a lot of execution and implementation. And that's why people struggle so much, whether it's job search, starting their business, getting a promotion. It's, it really comes down to the gap between how much they know and how much they execute. So I won't go into that tangent today, but it's just something that's part been on two, my mind. Part two incoming, but... Yeah. No, I, I love all of that. I think that one thing that I heard there that I wanted to call out too is when you go in this specialized route where you are owning your own business and specifically, Ellie, in your instance, you go on your own, you target directly to IOs and you create a tailored process. You do charge a higher premium for something like that because the process is almost like concierge. Like it's like you take care of people and you they're part of it. You work with them. And I think that that's super, super important. I know when I was a tennis coach, it was the same kind of deal when you were working at a smaller club versus a larger club. Like sometimes like they get lumped into processes and then in a smaller club, they get a more personalized experience. So I mm -hmm. totally, totally understand and resonate with that. And uh, Joe, we did do some marketing throughout our time. We did, we did a little bit, but then I didn't understand what was going on. I just, yeah, I just we, my we had a couple session. like I remember us at the beginning, like talking about our marketing strategies and what we were going to do. And then I think we just started focusing on school and just completely threw it away. So like, here, we are. here we are. Uh, so Ellie, I know we're running a little low on time, but I want to make sure I ask one more question before our final question. And since one of the ones that we prepped isn't, uh, it's kind of like our final question, I'll save that. But specifically what I wanted to ask you uh, was in relation to your previous experience and tying that into the work you're doing now. I know you've mentioned like you do some recruiting, consulting and things of that nature. So what kind of experience or what kind of work have you been able to do because of the experience you had before you went on your own? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Having been a recruiter and currently being a recruitment consultant helps me a lot because I can use anecdotes from those experiences to really solidify my teachings and actually persuade people. So this is going to get a little meta, but stick with me. I teach this exact strategy to my job seeker clients. If you tell a story, it gives substance to what you're trying to convey. So let's say I'm working with a client and they feel really strange about following up with their recruiter. And I, I say, yeah, I totally understand that. But I often think back to a candidate of mine. I'm going to call her Kylie. She followed up with me right after an interview and her 
email just put a big old smile on my face and it made me so excited to move her into the next steps because I just loved her approach. And it made it easier for me to send those next steps because I didn't have to go and compose an email and find her email address and type it all out. I just had to hit reply. So she made my life easier. If I instead said, well, don't worry, recruiters get follow-ups all the time, you're fine. Which one's more convincing? Probably the anecdote story. And so it's kind of the same thing in interviews. If you say, oh, yeah, I've done competency modeling. I'm fully competent in that. I have no, no concerns. Versus if you tell a story about a competency model that you built for a client last year um, and you tell us about the problems that they were facing and exactly the model that you built, you're just giving so much more detail. We get to really see your skills. So it's much more convincing. So those experiences and those anecdotes help me help me persuade my, my clients and, and help me help them. And additionally, I think that having been in an IO role, if we think about my other experiences beyond recruiting, uh, the role as a, a business intelligence analyst and having my master's in IO is really beneficial for my clients because, well, I think it'd be a little strange if I was a specialist in this field but didn't actually have any experience in it. Um, but for example, I'm working with one of my clients right now on a case study interview. And if I didn't have an IO background, I'd really only be able to give them feedback on the the formatting and the storytelling, which would probably be helpful. But instead, I'm able to give them a full and in-depth feedback on also the accuracy of the content, uh, as well as just the, the storytelling visuals and uh, how it looks and sounds. Uh, so that's really beneficial for me as well. No, that's perfect. I love that part about the stories. You're, you're absolutely, I mean, I absolutely agree. Giving a recruiter or a hiring manager something to remember you by, like a story that they could put a face to or like an action yeah. that they could put, like something that you did right to. Is so much better than just saying, I did this, I did that. And then five minutes later, you're off the call and you hope for the best. Throw it in the okay. star method too, just to make it even stronger. Yeah. No, it's, 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 it's amazing. Yeah. Uh, the anecdote. star method, my favorite. Go to, go to, go to Ellie's uh, profile to find out more about her opinion on that. It's really, it's not bad. It's not bad. It's better than nothing. I just think that there's better ways. Fair enough. Yeah. I can support that. But yeah, this the the story method is a perfect piece of advice for people looking for jobs. It's just it's a great way to have their recruiter and the hiring manager just remember who you are. Uh, which kind of leads us into our last question that we get to ask all our guests. Uh, do you have any like tips or advice for incoming IOs or maybe early career practitioners um, on how to really make the most of their degree and try to make the most out of their career mm -hmm. and find a job? Yeah. Have you two ever heard of the theory of constraints? Oh, I don't no? think so. Okay. So the theory of constraints hits, comes from supply and demand. And essentially what it says is that you can only grow to the limit of your constraint. So in other words, if you fail to problem solve in the early stages, if you skip those early stage issues, you won't be able to grow and succeed until those early stage issues are solved. So to put it in the context of a job seeker, there's essentially this order of operations that a job seeker needs to address before they can see success in their job hunt. So what we see happening a lot of time is that a job seeker is really worried about the resume. That's like the biggest job seeker concern. But actually what's more important to do is figure out the early stage fundamentals foundation, which is what do you want to do? What is your unique selling point? What is your story? A lot of people skip that because it feels fluffy and it feels like it's inconsequential to the bigger picture. But if we put those three things together, we have a foundation for a successful job hunt, but only if we do those three things first. Then you can get into the resume, interviews, and negotiations. This is also why I particularly like specializing in I.O. because as I talked about er earlier, we like to be really broad and we like to solve a lot of different problems. And IOs are really quite horrible at picking exactly what we want to do, <laughs> which is understandable. We want to be able to put IO psych into everything, but through casting that wide of a net, you actually limit yourself because it's really unclear to others exactly what you can do for them. And there's a saying that goes, a confused mind doesn't buy. That's a saying in sales. But I think the same is true for job seekers, that a confused hiring team doesn't hire you. So you have to do those fundamental steps first. Um, so figuring out, again, those three things. What do I want to do? What is my unique selling point? What is my story? Those three things set you up for success. Then you can start working on your resume. Then you can start working on your interview presence. 
then you work on negotiated negotiations. You've got to go in that order of operations because otherwise, if you start problem solving for those later stage issues, you're going to be stuck because you haven't problem solved for the earlier stage issues. Yeah, that's that's awesome. I that's something that what that makes me think about is like it's really good because IO is broad, so you can kind of blanket across the board apply to things and probably be relevant to them. But somebody who might have had knowledge that specializes specifically in the area that you're applying to might be more accessible to pull in for an interview because they they hit the nail on the head a little bit easier in their resume, easier in their cover letter. So if you start working on those things before you figure out what it is you want to do, then you're going to be trying to target too many topics and not be able to focus on it. And Ellie, I think that's really great advice for people who are trying to start their careers. I know a personal anecdote I can give is I started off in consulting because I wanted broad IO experience and I didn't know what area of IO I wanted to go into. And then when I was able to figure out from there where I want to go, I was able to parlay that into looking for a career specifically into learning and development. And I wouldn't have been able to do that without the broad experience, but then I was able to tailor my resume specifically to learning and development even though I have IO knowledge that hits on a lot of other topics, like we want to sometimes throw it all in there, but it's not relevant and it doesn't help. It actually probably hurts. So Ellie, I think that's great advice. I think that uh, students and early career and probably anybody at any point in their career can use that to help them try and navigate where they want to go for their next step for sure. I'm not sure if you remember this from the guest session that I did, but uh, I, I put together this visual that I think is really impactful for IOs when they take a look at it. And it's a visual of three candidate profiles. One of them is an, they list themselves as an IO psychologist. The other person lists themselves as a DEI specialist, assessment and selection specialist, and organizational development consultant. And then the third person lists themselves as an instructional designer. If I'm hiring for an instructional designer role, who am I going to hire? The person who calls themselves an instructional designer. While all three of those people could probably do the job, it's the person that is specific about what they can do and what they want. They are the ones that I'm going to pick. They are the easier pick. And in a market like we have, and in these competitive off roles that we have within IO, because our, our roles are very competitive, you have to be, you have to be the one. They, they're often only hiring one person. So, so be that person, be that person that they are looking for. Yeah, we, we have, maybe we should start using graphics, Brandon. Because I think I do remember that one. From, I remember that one your, too. Yeah. So, it's, it's so yeah, I nice. told you it's powerful. It's very memorable. Power of stories. Yeah, true. But it was it was beautiful advice, Allie. I really do think our listeners will uh, will enjoy it and hopefully use it because <laughs> that's why it's there. But thank you so much for, for joining us. We, we really had a great time. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. This was so much fun. I wish we could keep going. The same year we're... We're all too social for this. When you put three podcasters together, it just gets, it can go on for hours. So true. But thank you for so coming true. on. We appreciate it. Of course. Thank you. Uh, that was a fun episode, Joe. I know uh, we got to hear Ellie speak in a little while ago, back when we were students. So full circle now being in our career, that it's kind of cool to, uh, to kind of see her advice and use it to our advantage to help us land jobs. No, I'm very, I was very excited to, to talk to Ellie because I know like you see her LinkedIn post all the time. Um, she got to talk to us and like our entire class. So to have some like time with just us and her, it was, it was great. And she, she really does give great advice having bring that like background as a recruiter to her coaching organization. It was really cool like to, to hear her from that point of view. Yeah, I, I agree a hundred percent. And I, I really thought what stuck out to me the most was just the idea of focusing on like your specialization or focusing on what you're applying to, because I think the broadness of IO can sometimes be the detriment in the application process for IOs. And I thought that was really awesome to hear. I know we talked about it in our workshop and then her speaking about it really just kind of emphasized that for me. I don't know how you felt about that, but I thought that was really cool. No, no, really. Likewise, I, I had a great time listening to her. <laughs> like I'm going to try to use some of her advice in my, in my own uh role and like professional career uh, but thank you everybody for for listening we hope you enjoyed uh we hope you enjoyed yeah we'll catch you guys in two weeks